So let's get started. Uh, the slides should be up on the website. Um, I just put them up like 10 minutes ago, so if you, if you want to follow along online, they should be up. Okay, so today, last class, I got a lot of questions about how all the, all the mathematical calculations I need are for maximizing your expected number of chips. And so a lot of you complained and said, oh, but staying alive in the tournament and just folding a lot is really important, even if you don't maximize your expected number of chips. So since there were a lot of questions about that, I thought I'd put a little bit more in depth on this phenomenon. So usually the, the word for this phenomenon is called ICM which stands for independent chip model. So, okay, so in a cash game, so I talked about this first class, a cash game is where you just play poker at a table, you bring real dollars with you, and you can play for however much you want, you can bring as much money as you want, it doesn't really matter how much money you bring. So, in this game, the chips are basically the dollars, right? The big blind will be two dollars or something like that. And every chip is just dollars. So. Clearly in this situation, maximizing your number of chips is what you want to do, right? Because if you're just maximizing your number of dollars. There's no factor like, oh, I have to survive, because if you lose all your money, you can always bring more money, and you can leave at any time, you can join at any time. So, is that clear? So normally, in a cash game, you want to just maximize your expected number of chips. So that's clear, that's clear right? That makes sense? Okay. Um, so now I told you to do the same thing in tournaments, but there is this factor of staying alive in tournaments, right? If you lose all your chips, you can't just take another hundred dollars out of your wallet and come back into the tournament. So, so this is relevant, but the thing is, this factor is not as relevant as, as I think a lot of people are thinking. So I'm going to mathematically calculate this. Okay, so. ICM is basically a way to calculate exactly what your equity in the tournament is. So, let's say there's three players left, okay, and first pays five dollars, second pays three dollars, and third pays two dollars. So the statement of ICM, which is a very reasonable statement, is it says your chances of winning the tournament is proportional to your percentage of the total chips. So in this situation, the statement would mean player one would win the tournament 50% of the time. Because Oh, sorry. Um, so, so suppose the chip stacks are player A has 5,000 chips, player B has 3,000 chips, and player C has 2,000 chips. Then, then, um, there's a, yeah, sorry, I meant, yeah, okay, so, yeah, there's a, sorry, okay, um, yeah, I meant if you're player C, okay, so, uh, the slide is wrong, okay, so, if you're player A, your chances of winning the tournament is 50%. So, if you're person C, then your chances of winning is 20% by this model. And then to calculate your chances of coming second, so um, I guess this is just some probability math, it's, hopefully everyone knows what I mean. So, right, so, so you're trying to calculate the chances that you come second, and the way you do this is you condition on the fact that player A wins, versus, and also condition on the fact that player B wins. So, um, so okay, so so is this is this clear to everyone what I mean by condition? So you first consider the case where player A wins, and that happens 50% of the time. And assuming that happens, if you know for a fact that player A will win, your chances of coming second is basically um, is basically your. Oh wow, okay, I'm gonna some. Sorry, I sorry. Okay, I'm gonna just edit this. Um, Okay, sorry, I apologize. Okay, I made this in such a good way. Okay, sorry, this is wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys, hold up. Um, okay, so let me first, let me first. Okay, so if you're, if you're person C, your chances of winning are 20%. Okay, your chances of coming second. You first look at that case where A wins, which happens 50% of the time. And then your chances of coming second is simply 2,000 divided by 5,000. It's 2,000 because if player A wins, you just got to take your number of chips, which is 2,000, divided by the total number of chips that don't belong to player A, which is 5,000, right? Because if you assume that player A wins, then between the two of you, the one who survives the longer, is proportional to your number of chips. So it's 2,000 divided by 5,000, which is 0 0.4. Okay, I did that right, right? Okay. 
and then conditioned on the fact that on the fact that player B wins, your chances of coming second is 2,000 over 7,000 because player A has 5,000 chips. So this is so this is um, 2 over 7. Okay, so overall, overall your chances of coming second is one fifth. So I sort of skipped a step. This is actually 0 0.5 times 0 0.4. Okay, so at least the final number is right. Okay, I, I apologize. So, uh, okay, okay, this should be correct. Um, So th this is correct. Okay, I, I apologize for that. I messed up a bunch of numbers. Okay, so th does this make sense? Yeah, I'll run that through again. So, because there were mistakes the first time. So, to calculate your chances of coming second, you first consider the case where A wins, which happens 50% of the time, and then after that happens, your chances of winning is just 2,000 divided by the sum of your chips plus player B chips plus player B's chips, which is 0 0.4. And condition on the fact that player B wins, your chances of coming second is is 2,000 divided by the sum of your chips plus player A's chips, which is 7,000. So it's two sevens. So overall, your chances of coming in second is actually two sevens. So, so when you do all these numbers, you actually get two sevens back, which is just kind of a mathematical coincidence. So your equity in this situation is basically, it's $2 plus 0 0.2 times $3. So you have a you have a 20% chance of winning an additional $3, right? Because the payoffs are first place pays $5, then second place pays $3, and third place pays $2. So your equity is $2, which are guaranteed, plus 0 0.2 times the extra $3 from going first. And then 2 sevenths is approximately 0.285, so just 0.29 chances of that of winning the extra dollar. So your equity here, even though you only have 20% of all the chips, is actually 28.9, 29% of all the money. Okay, so doing that calculation, even though I messed it up by the first time, so I'm going to go back to this now. So you actually don't have to practice how to do that calculation very well, because it's impossible in practice anyway. So if there's like seven points left, to calculate the chances of you coming sixth, you need to do basically a, you need to sum 120 terms because you got to consider you got to consider um, all possibilities of five. Actually, it's more than that. So okay, there's there's lots of math mistakes. Here. It's actually more than that because of the other six players, you got to choose five of them and consider all five orders. So I guess it's like yeah, you got to multiply this by like six or something. Yes. Okay. So it's like it's six factor. It's, it's like seven hundred twenty. Okay, so what, I'm clearly not very good at math. But the point is, it is, it's very easy to calculate these numbers. Um, you just Google ICM calculator and it'll do it for you. Okay, hopefully there's no more math mistakes. Okay. Um, okay, so okay, let's look at an actual situation. So it's going to be the same situation, and now we're going to plug in some calculations with some actual cards. So there's three players left. And it's the same thing, the payouts are 532, and the stack sizes will also be 5,000, 3,000, 2,000. So we're going to need to do some math for how much equity you need to call an all in. And this calculation is going to take into consideration the fact that you're wanting to stay alive in the tournament. So the, this calculation purely maximizes your expected money payout. It doesn't just maximize your expected chip payout from the tournament. So if this calculation says that you should call, this already takes into consideration all factors. There shouldn't be any more complaints about, oh, I want to stay alive in the tournament. Because this calculation already takes into account the fact that you want to stay alive in the tournament. So, okay, so let's say the situation is this, right? So the, the starting stack sizes were 5,000, 3,000, 2,000. You're the player with 3,000 chips, and the payouts are 5, 3, 2. And the button goes all in for 1900, right? So the big blind is 400, and the ante was 100. So in this situation, you need you need to call 1500, after which the pot will be 4300. So 
normally, if this was a cash game, if you were playing for dollars, you would need 35% equity with your hand for the play to be a positive expectation play. Okay, but under ICM, the calculation is slightly different because your equity is not exactly how many chips you have. So you need to consider the three possibilities. So let's suppose if you fold. If you fold, then this guy will win the pot, which is gonna be in total 2,800 chips, right? 1,900 plus 900. I didn't mess that up, right? Okay, good. So your stack will be 2,500, and the other guy's stacks will be 2,847. So equity, according to the ICM calculator, is not $2.5, it's actually $3.07. Okay, now let's consider the case where I call and I lose. If I call and I lose, then I'm going down to 1,000 chips, and the other two guys will have 4,300 and 4,700. If you plug it into the ICM calculator, it's going to tell you your equity here isn't a dollar like it would be if it was just the 1,000 divided by the 10,000 total chips. Your equity here is actually $2.46. Which makes sense, right? Your equity should never be less than two dollars because third place guarantees at least two dollars. So your equity here is two dollars and forty-six cents. Okay. The third case is you call and you win. Then the button will be knocked out, and you're going to have fifty-three hundred chips, and the other guy will have forty-seven hundred. Then your equity is three dollars, which is guaranteed now, plus. 0.53 chance of winning an additional two dollars, right? Because you have 53 percent of the chips now, is 4.06 dollars. So okay, so the way to calculate this is you, you suppose your chances of winning the hand is x. So x needs to be high enough such that your expected payoff from calling is greater than your expected payoff from folding, right? So we know that your expected payoff from folding is three dollars and seven cents because if you fold, this is what the stacks will look like, and that's what the ICM calculator will say. So, make sure you actually understand this calculation, because the previous calculation you never have to do by yourself. This calculation you actually have to do all the time, by yourself. So, make sure you understand how to do this calculation. Um, that's why I messed the other one up so bad, because I, I never practiced it. Okay. Um, so, if you fold, your, your equity is $3.07. Now, if you call, then it's x, which is your chances of winning, times 4.06, plus 1 minus x, which is your chances of losing, times 2.46. So if you solve, you'll get that as long as x is at least 38%, this is a positive money payoff play. So as you can see, if you do the old calculation that I did, you needed 35%. But if you take into account the consideration that you want to stay alive as long as possible, you still only need 38% so yes, you, you could fold a bit more because you're trying to stay alive, but the difference is not that high. I did a rigorous mathematical calculation proving that the equity you need is only 3% higher in this situation than what you normally need. So this is what basically an ICM calculator looks like. So you know you, you plug in the, the stack sizes, and it'll tell you player one's chances of coming first, second, third. Uh, sorry, this is I guess. Sorry, it's, I guess it's here. Um, yeah, player one's chances of, so this is like the total payoff. So the, this is like player one's expected payoff, player two's expected payoff, player three's expected payoff, and the total payoff is 100. Yeah, I guess this number is the sum of these three numbers. So like, this number is the chances of winning times 50. Okay, right, so let's assume that the button is going on with 50% of hands, then, then with, with, even with 7 6 suited, the hand that's only 7 high, this has 39% equity and it would be enough to call. And with king 3 offsuit, it would definitely be enough to call. And if his range is only the top 30% of hands, which is absurdly tight, then you still, you, you only have 37.6 equity. So remember the numbers. We needed 38% equity for the play to be plus money expectation, and we needed 35% equity for the play to be plus chip expectation. So if you call with, if you call in this situation where you only have 37.6% equity, it would be, you would be maximizing your expected number of chips, that would be positive. 
but your expected money would actually be, be negative. So calling is a bad play because even though it, the, the expected shift change is positive, the expected money change is negative. Okay, so here's a few cases where ICM is easy to calculate. So no more numbers, um, just some general pointers. So in cash games, there's no such thing as ICM, right? I already talked about this. You always maximize your expected number of chips. And in winner take all tournaments, suppose the tournament only had a prize for first place. It's the same thing. Because your expected number of chips is proportional to your chance of winning the tournament. And you only get paid for the play and go get it first. And like, if there's only two players left in the tournament, it's the same situation as a winner take all tournament. Because you can just assume you're both guaranteed the minimum payout and there's a bonus for the winner. So, so in these situations, you should be you should be riskier than in the tournaments that you've been playing online. But in the, even in the tournaments that you're playing online, based on what I've seen from watching, people are still being way too risk averse. Like, so remember, just usually the percentage equity that you need to call is only going to be two or three percent higher than normal. So if you calculate that you need thirty-five percent equity to call, if you don't want to do this entire ICM calculation, then just add like two or three percent to what you need, and that's that would usually be about it. Okay, so I did choose an example in this calculation where the difference between money EV and shipping EV is small. So one example if you see where the difference can be big is imagine you're far into the payouts of a big tournament and you have let's say just 0.1% of the chips, right? Then clearly so much is a very small fraction of the chips. So clearly your your money will be significantly higher than the chip EV because your chip EV, you have such a small percentage of the chips that your chip EV is like zero, but your money EV is still pretty high because you're guaranteed like an, an, a ninth place payoff or an eighth place payoff or whatever. So in this case, folding a really good hand could potentially be okay just to like survive longer since you have no hope of winning the tournament anyway. So another example of extreme ICM tournaments is satellite tournaments. So what this means is, suppose there was like a tournament where the top nine players got a free trip to Paris or something. The top nine players got a good vacation, and you get the same prize. You don't get any more for coming first rather than coming ninth. Okay, so the top nine players all get the same prize, and there's ten players left. So in this situation, you just want to survive. And, and because there's no incentive for trying to win, but in the tournaments online, that you're playing right now, there's a still a very big incentive for trying to win. Like, first we'll give you like 10 points, and like ninth we'll give you like two points or something, right? So, so in satellites, there can be extreme examples where someone goes all in, and you have like pocket aces, and you have to fold just because you can't risk it. And even if they tell you, oh, oh, look, I have three two offsuit, you still have to fold even if you have pocket aces, knowing that they have three two offsuit, just because calling and risking coming tenth and not having that vacation is so drastic compared to the benefit of winning and having a chance of winning get coming first because coming first doesn't matter. So so yeah, so satellites are sort of so some more facts about ICM. So small stacks have a higher money EV than ship EV. Big stacks have a lower money EV than ship EV. And when there's about to be a large pay jump, the difference between money EV and ship EV is more significant. So, like, you know, if it's about to be the final table, or on any any time on the final table, the difference between money EV and ship EV is significant. If it's the early on in a tournament, basically money EV and ship EV are the same. Like, if it's the first hand of a tournament, you should just maximize your number of chips. There's no point in trying to survive when it's the beginning of a tournament because you have no hope of surviving if you don't win some chips, right? So that makes sense. And in general, in these situations, the big stacks should go all in more frequently, and the small stacks should rarely go all, all in. So you're going to see some examples of this when I finish replaying the tournament that I started replaying last night. Right. So the point of ICM is basically, you know, it's like it's like a traffic intersection game. So on the way here, I was running late, and um, I was trying to go as fast as I can on my bike. And you know, it's like the situation where. 
like if I'm trying to cross the street and a car is trying to cross the street, if I just go onto the street, I know that the car cannot possibly run me over. And like I was just trying to go really fast, so I just I had to do a lot of risky things to get here, trying to get here on time. It's sort of like the same thing with ICM in the situation where if the top nine players get a get a free vacation. You know, if I I'm, if I'm just telling my opponent that I have three two offsuit and I'm going all in, even if he has pocket aces. She can't call, and I know that. And I just, you know, it's sort of like going on with three two off street. With three two off street, is like going in the middle of the street where you, you know, it's stupid, but you know that the other guy can't run you over. It's like the same thing. You go on with three two off street, you know it's stupid, but you know the other guy can't just call it. Right? This is like, um, if you're familiar with the term prisoner's dilemma, this is like a prisoner's dilemma situation, basically. Okay. So, are there any questions about that? So, I, I, I went pretty in depth into that, more than I was initially intending to, but there, I, I got a lot of questions about this and I thought the math might be interesting, so are there any questions about this before I go on? Yeah? Yeah. So in the ten person strategy, is there a um, If all players play optimally, what would usually happen is the first guy to act would just go all in with any two cards, and then everyone else would but if, if you're the first person to act, you might as well go all in with any two cards because you know what you're going to do. So that tournament will never end until the blinds go up. And eventually the blinds will be so hot that a player will be all in and just the and then go up. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, so some people are going to memorize. I also got some questions about this. So it's good to just look at slides like this and just memorize some of these percentages. But there's some basic rules of thumb, and I talked about this, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Basically, bigger player against smaller player is usually you're around 80%. A pair against zero over cards, so like a pair against two cards that are smaller is usually 80% 80, 80 as well. It can vary a lot, like pocket aces against ace king offsuit, you're as good as 93%. Um, like queens against 7 4 off, 84.8%. Jacks against 10 nine suited, 81.7%. Here's two trivia facts that might be cool. Um, what's the hand that does best against pocket aces? The answer is 6-5 suited. 6-5 suited is 22.5%, which is better than any other hand against pocket aces. And the other trivia question is, what's the highest equity you can possibly have getting it all in pre -flop? And the answer is pocket kings against king 2 offsuit, which is 94.6%. Um, it's not pocket aces against ace 2 offsuit because they can hit a straight game basically with an ace of it too, because they only need three cards. Okay, here's some other pre flop numbers. A pair against one over card is you're usually a 70-30, so queens against ace jack. As you can see, queens against ace jack suited, you're about 3% worse, 4% worse, you're only 68%. So the flush, being suited and being able to hit the flush is very relevant. Well and it doesn't matter if their other card is the same as you, it's still around the same. So, queens against ace queen suited. So, it is, it is a bit worse because it's harder for you to hit three of a kind. But it's not too much worse, it's like 2% worse. Ace queen suited as opposed to ace jack suited. Uh, yeah, so, here's more examples. Okay, so, if you're dominating the other person, which means ace king against ace queen, or ace queen against ace jack, you're usually also around 70 30. So, if you look, if you look, ace king against ace queen offsuit is 75.4%. Um, ace king against king queen is slightly is ace king against king queen is 74.8%. So it's it's slightly better because if you have the same top card, the, the board can have two pair like two two three three four, and then ace king will tie ace queen. But against king queen, if the board comes two two three three four, you don't tie. You so it's usually better to have the same small card rather than have the same big card. Um, so as you notice, ace fives off against ace two off, you're only 56%. You're only barely better than 50%. And the reason is because it, the reason is because usually the five won't even matter when five cards come on the board, right? If the five cards on the board is six, eight, ten, queen, king, your five doesn't even matter. For your five, you map, you need two cards between two and five. So like you need like a three and a four for your five, right? So 
So that's why it's only 56%. As you can see, it gets lower and lower as your as the car, other card you have is smaller. Ace 8 against Ace 2 is 65%. Ace Jack against Ace 2 is 72%. Ace King against Ace 2 is going to be like 75% or something. Two overcards versus a pair is about 50-50. It varies. Ace King against Queens is only 43% because Queens block a lot of your straights. And 10-9 suited against pocket twos is a whopping 54% because you can hit lots of straights and they have no blockers to you. Um, okay, if you assume that A is greater than B greater than C greater than D, where all four cards are different, usually if you have the A, you're going to be a 60 40 around. I mean, it depends on a lot of factors, but a general rule of thumb is if you have the highest card and all four cards are different, you're around 60 40. So, Ace King against 7 6, 61%. Ace King against Queen 7 is 67%. Um, if you have Ace 2 offsuit against 10 9 suited, you're only 51%. So, I guess that's a bit different. So, remember some numbers. Okay, so let's look at this chart carefully. Ace King off against Ace Queen suited, you're 70. Actually, let's look at this first. So, Ace King off against Ace Queen off, you're 74.4%. Okay? If you make your card suited, you only increase by 1%. But if you make their card suited, you drop off by like 4%. And suitedness changes your equity so much when you're behind. Whereas it changes your equity much less when you're ahead. Because when you're, when you're behind, you need as much ways to, to improve and beat them as possible, right? So suiting just matters a lot. But if you have a hand as good as ace-king, the difference between ace-king suited and ace-king offsuit isn't that high, because usually you're going to be winning anyway without having to hit the flush. So that's so suited just matters a lot more when you have a hand like five four. You must, must, must need your hand to be suited. Five four suited is just miles and miles better than five four offsuit. But ace king suited and ace king offsuit are kind of similar. So this is so good anyway. So this is why when you're the one going all in, you really want a suited hand. But if you're the one calling, you know the difference between whether I should call with ace jack offsuit and ace jack suited is very minimal. But the difference of whether I should go all in with five four suited versus five four offsuit is very high. So. Yeah, so I would go all in with 7-6 suited for 15 big lines from my hijack. But I would not go all in with 7-6 offsuit from the butt. So if you notice in this situation, there's four players behind me you can call, and I'm going to go all in. But in this situation, there's only two players behind me you can call, and I'm not going to go all in. And so it matters so much when I have a small, when I have small cards. So, so right, so if you remember the three factors of pre flop, like, right, it's cards, obviously the most important thing, and then position. So the later the position, the more frequently you go on, right? Effective stack size. The smaller your effective stack stack size, the less your risk is, so the more frequently you can go on. And so one important thing to notice is when the effective stack size is small, you could get called with very weak cards just because their odds are so good. Like, do you remember a few classes ago, there was an example where the big blind called 2-7 offsuit because you only have three big blinds or something? So when the odds are really good and the stack sizes are really small, you should be prepared to get called by any two cards. So, the, so one important thing to realize is to shove hands like 8-7 suited, the most important thing is that you have lots of chips, right? Because with hands like E7 suited, you don't want them to call it 9-6 offsuit. That hand just crushes you. But you don't care that much if you have all of the hand like Ace King, because you're actually doing okay against good hands. So with hands like that, you basically the most important thing is having lots of chips. So of these three factors, with a hand like eight seven suited, effective stack size matters a lot more. You absolutely must have a lot of chips before you go all in, because you need them to fold very frequently. You need them to only call good hands, since your hand does well against good hands and bad against bad hands. Right? And then you shove hands like ace two offsuit. The most important thing is having not that many players behind you. Because you don't care if you get called frequently. If your guys, if the other guy's gonna call you with nine three offsuit, you're, you're ahead, you have an ace in your hand. But the most important thing, thing with ace two offsuit is you do not want lots of players behind you. Because you're crushed if someone picks up ace jack or like pocket queen or something, right? You're you're absolutely crushed against good hands and you do well against bad hands. So 
When you're trying to go all in, there's basically two classes of hands. And it's important to keep this in mind. So remember, there's always three factors of determining when you want to go all in, right? There's three factors. But the point is, for small student cards, you really need three. Factors three is a lot more important. You need to have a lot of chips. And for big, for cards like Ace Two Offsuit, King Six Offsuit, that have a big card in them but are just crushed by good hands, you need there to be few players behind you who have a chance of picking up pocket aces, pocket kings. Okay, so that's the end of the PowerPoint slides. I'm going to run through my tournament. Uh, I'm going to run through my tournament now. I'm going to take a three-minute break. I guess I'll start again in three minutes. Yeah, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask me.